lovely to speak to you today, Rachel. And we're going to be talking about how leaders can manage sort of delivering now and delivering for the future. Um, obviously, you know, it's quite difficult economically and the outlook looks a bit difficult economically across the world. Um, so I'm wondering, how are you seeing that picture looking? Um, how do you see that impacting leadership behaviours? Well, you're absolutely right. It is genuinely a hugely uncertain time at the moment. And I think the difference this time around is there are so many factors that we've just never had to face before as a, as a globe and as, as business. Um, and I think that is influencing individuals' behaviours, leadership behaviours in the sense that there isn't a kind of knee-jerk, everything stops which is good. Um, but at the same time, there's this kind of stop start feeling of just where are we going? How long is things going to last? We've got the energy crisis, which is against the inflation, which is against the countermeasures of interest rate hikes and so on. And all of these themselves are kind of feeding into ongoing issues, even, even the measures to try and counter. So it is a very, very difficult time for businesses at the moment. But I think what we need to see is the ability where possible to hold hold your nerve um, and not just put everything on ice. Um, and as we've seen in previous downturns and recessions, that has been the knee-jerk response. And what happens is businesses end up paying for that for a long time in the future. So we see gaps, huge gaps emerge in skill sets, in succession plans, when businesses just put all their strategy on hold, all hiring on hold, all thinking about their talent agenda on hold means that four, five, ten years down the line, um, you're then playing another round of catch up. So I think that's the important piece this time is where possible, got your future business strategy, hold your nerve where you can so that your talent agenda is not then damaged. So we've been talking about talent shortages and, and labour shortages uh, recently and, you know, uh, although we might see some people coming back into the labour market, um, are they the right people is, is the big question. So what you're really saying is we need to, to be brave and try and balance focusing on that longer term strategy as well as the immediate. The factor in all of this is that the talent shortage across the globe hasn't abated. So whilst we've got uncertain economic times, um, whilst consumer confidence is for sure impacted, actually businesses are still grappling for the skills they need. There is a global labour shortage from bottom up. And when you start to then bring into account the kind of the emerging skill sets that are needed, the newer leadership styles, which, which we're going to come on to, then that is doubly impacting, um, impacting things. Well, that leads very nicely into what are, are the new skills that you're seeing that leaders require out there. And, uh, you know, again, it's important that they keep you know, developing those, isn't it? Rather than just go straight back to like, right, you know, the old style of leadership. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think we've seen this um, increasingly so since the pandemic. Um, and I think obviously what that did was a huge shock to the system um, and the world went virtual, the world went on lockdown. Um, you know, businesses were looking really quickly to try and do things differently. And what that brought into sharp focus is the need for a newer style of leadership. And that is a style that is much more empathetic. Um, the old command and control, top down, everything sort of trickles down uniformly to an organization isn't appropriate anymore. Leaders need high EQ. Um, and again, it's, it's that ability to influence um, globally like never before, but bringing together workforces that actually are very disparate now. They are from home still, they are global, they are digitized. And of course, against all of that, your consumer base has changed beyond recognition and their behaviors. So again, all of this um, uncertainty, it's, it's about the ability to equally manage the shades of gray, manage and steer through uncertainty, be flexible. So whilst we said, hold your nerves, in terms of not letting sight of your strategy, that strategy has to flex to get you to that end goal ever more so in these, in these times. Oh, and what, do, what does this mean in practice to organisations uh, in areas like succession planning or organisation design? How do you bring that sort of new leadership approach into practice, into policy and practice? I think what um, businesses really need now is that agility. So um, 
increasingly now we see that businesses are looking to hire for skills rather than experiences and, and set roles. Um, and that is super important. So you're looking for uh, leaders now that have a much broader range of skill sets and so all the high EQ, everything that I've just mentioned is, is, is really important. And what that means is the traditional kind of vertical succession plan that um, you would see in a business is not delivering that kind of leader. They are too narrow. So businesses that are really on this are starting to look at the, how do we get that breadth of leadership experience from increasing the pathways for leaders to reach the top. And I think that's really important now. So, and again, that kind of removes the command and control uh, that we've talked about before. And it's still actually for a lot of businesses, there aren't enough of that type of skill set, that type of leadership existing in their current businesses. And that's where they're really having to think differently about where do they find talent externally and equally, how do you um, grow and nurture that talent internally and where's it going to come from? And then that's a big change. That's interesting. Only this morning I was uh, uh, reading a LinkedIn post, uh, which the CBI said that in terms of that looking for skills, you know, that for, for a long time we've hired white men on potential and on the, the sort of potential skills, whereas uh, we haven't really done that for women and for um, ethnic minorities where we always look at past performance. So I, I think we're going to be forced into that now, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> Actually, it's a hugely good thing. I mean, in fact, that's, that, that potentially is a whole different topic around the DEI lens. But of course, if you're hiring for skills rather than acquired experiences, it opens up the talent pool by definition. Um, and you can train and you can give people exposure to roles and to how to do a job. It's the skill set, the, 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 the innate, um, behaviors and the know-how, the EQ, et cetera, is much, much harder to train. So if you're looking for that broader skill set, you can find it in a broader population of people. So, so um, you know, we, we talk about developing um, people through succession plans, for example, but what, what sort of practical ways can we bring this future leadership in? So obviously we've talked about what we need, but I mean, you know, tomorrow, as of tomorrow, what could somebody start doing to try and, and bring that new form of leader into the business? There are probably two key areas that businesses can really focus on. The first is internal. The second is external. So from an internal perspective, it's, it is, it is really, it's pairing up the idea of your vertical succession plans and your boxes and somebody has to move there to there to there. That is no longer, um, working for, for organizations. So you're now starting to look at your talent pool holistically and you're starting to think about how do we create an environment where people can much more easily move across roles and develop their career maybe horizontally first with some parallel moves before they start moving up because that's how you're getting that well-rounded breadth of experience. So that's sort of from an internal perspective. Externally then it's thinking about that longer term strategy, where is the business going and matching the leadership strategy against that. So that's where you know, working with organizations like ourselves, like Armstrong Craven around building external talent pipelines. So these are not candidates for open vacancies today. It is building a relationship and a network with the talent you need, you know, with a, with a future lens and, and hiring it when the time is right, that you're being able to strategically place those individuals into your succession plan and develop them at a time that suits both you and the, and the external pipeline. So it is moving away from the vertical succession plan and it is moving away from the wait till there's a vacancy and then knee jerk to an external headhunt. Those are the two main areas, I think. And in terms of that internal picture, um, where do, where does something like coaching come in? Because obviously you need to explain to people what those skills opportunity, what opportunities there are, and then help them to get the skills to be able to go to that, that level, um, and match them up with skills perhaps that you didn't know they had <laughs> through clever yeah. technology and, and likewise. But I wonder, you know, what, what other things, um, HR and people leaders could be looking at in order to, um, to ensure that that works in practice. Well, we've certainly seen some interesting examples where businesses are using and HR is using 
um, I, AI technology, for example, to create an, an internal job market um, and actually um, by putting your details into into the, the the system, as it was in into that market, you know that it can actually match up and suggest roles for you that you would be suitable for. And again, it is thinking about that breadth. You've got the um, you know the intrinsic skill set um, and behaviours and capabilities to try um, a role over here that might be slightly different to, to your your current path. I think the important part when you're talking about coaching and so on is is that this is all done. Um, it's all done really openly and and cognizantly, if that's the right word. It, it's about, this isn't just a move for move's sake. This is absolutely part of the plan. When it's vertical, you would have called it your succession plan or my own development plan, and it would have been up here. But now it's recognizing that that can just take you much broader so that time I spend here is about gaining these skills. The time I spend over here is about rounding myself out in in this area and if hr the line manager and the the talent themselves are all aware of this then it is a very open process we talk a lot about about things like this um i, I wonder you mentioned you're seeing some clients how, you know how how widespread is it in terms of people beginning to look differently at, uh, at how they hire and looking for skills in internal marketplaces and could you share any sort of uh, examples you've seen in in practice amongst your clients firstly i would say it, it's not as widespread as it needs to be yet for sure i think we are seeing some of our clients doing some very interesting things we are working with a business that has got the uh, internal job market and they have uh, they are using some ai technology to create those matches and suggestions and prompts for people um we're seeing some businesses that have um a kind of suite of projects and individuals can put themselves forward and actually they are have carved time out in their week to be able to dedicate to the corporate projects which again is giving them clearly exposure to other parts of the business, it's, and again, it's honing their influencing skills, their leadership skills, and so on. But the important thing is, time out of their week is it, safeguard, it's ring fenced to do that. So four days a week, they might be doing their current role, and then one day a week is freed up to take part in the corporate project. And I think that's the other thing that we are seeing from um, forward thinking businesses is this idea that um, it has to happen. So a career move, a role move, and so on, a secondment, it has to happen. So leaders are actually being mandated to free up their talent. You can't grab hold of keep your talent and keep it in the silo because you want it in, in your business. You have to be able to release that talent if it's, um, if it's requested of you. And I what? think that's probably practically um, a good thing. Um, what what do you think are, are barriers when when that uh, has been put in place? You know, it's quite a massive. Well, it is a, a massive shift in in the way people think, both the employer but also the employee to to think that way about their career. So, you know, what what in your mind are, are, are barriers or uh, issues, pieces, or challenges people have faced when doing this? I think I sort of touched on it. Um, it you know, when I said, if, if, it, you know, to make this work, in some cases, we're seeing it being mandated because if you don't, then actually it's, well, yes, I'm not quite ready to let that person go yet. I need them to do this first, or they're too critical for my area of the business, and therefore I'm not going to um, release them. And obviously, the flip side of that, because that sentiment is there, the flip side for the talent itself is all oh, well. I think that might be damaging to my career if I, you know, if I if I take a leap into uncharted, uncharted territories. Am I leaving behind actually where my succession planning is going? So it is a whole organisation mindset shift that is needed, um, which then creates the environment for, and it's equally for individuals for the for the talent, if you like, to be more readily asking for these opportunities and knocking on doors. And again, that's where you'll start to see um, more representation come through because, you know, the stories are there, the case studies are there. So um, an individual from an underrepresented background, be it gender, ethnicity, whatever, will say, I, yeah, I can do that. I would like to ask for that. Whereas now we just don't see that. That, that sense of permission just isn't there. So is, is this a trend you're seeing across all markets or is it is it just you know uk america where where are you seeing it i think it's it's 
it's a growing trend and yes, it is across all markets. I think it's, but it's about where we're seeing it really work and, and pay off is, is, is those forward thinking organizations. Now they can be, um, if I'm thinking about some of the conversations we've had recently, it might be a global bank. It might be, um, a brand company. It might be a chemicals company or an electronics firm. So sector wise, it, it's not restricted. It's definitely just that, that idea of globally thinking. So. I think we are seeing it more successfully, obviously, in, in global organizations that have that global talent base to, to move around. Um, it's, but as I said, it's not um, as prevalent as it needs to be, for sure, which is why it still feels so painful to implement. So, you know, there, there's definitely that kind of hurdle to overcome for business to, to successfully implement something like this. And the same applies for the external talent pipelining piece, actually, it is that same mindset of how do we engage talent externally ahead of need? Because we're so geared to today and the short term and organizations that really embrace that idea of nurturing and maintaining and networking with an external talent pipeline are the ones that really, really benefit from it. How would you at uh, Armstrong Craven help a, a, a client in this area? With, with with building talent pipelines, um, absolutely, that's that's a core area of what we of what we do. Um, so we would work with an organisation to understand um, their current talent strategy, where they are wanting to go, and therefore what kind of skills they're wanting to bring into the organisation, and then not dissimilar to a headhunt actually, but it is absolutely that ground up research approach to identify the right kind of profiles of individuals that would be right. We engage those individuals. We tell them the story of what the businesses try, our clients are trying to achieve in terms of moving to this future focused pipelining strategy. Um, it's overwhelmingly well received by the talent in, in the marketplace, actually, this idea of being able to build a relationship with organizations ahead of need. It takes that pressure off, um, a, you know, a headhunt situation where there is a, there is a vacancy and everything's urgent. So it's very well received by the talent itself. And, and actually it's a great way of networking and sharing ideas as this, um, you know, as this pipeline is created. So our job is to build the pipeline and, you hand it over and to support where needed to, to nurture those relationships going forward. But ultimately it's giving the control of the relationships with talent to, to our clients. And, and to, to wrap up, if you were, you know, somebody listening to this or watching this, um, was thinking, right, I need to think a bit more about my own skills and making sure I'm fit for the, for this purpose. And I can manage this, this balance between the short term and the longer time. What, what are the th first three actions or the first three steps you think leaders should take? I think it's, it's absolutely thinking about where has my own career been and where is it needing to go and how am I going to get there? But it's with the lens of thinking well-rounded. Um, so it isn't just a case of I was a manager, now I'm a senior manager and I want to be a director and a senior director and a VP. It's actually, have I got experience of different markets, different geographies, different business units? How can I get that? So if my ultimate aim is to be, let's say, the CEO, well, then you look at that leadership team and you think, which bits of that can I build into my, my, my background, my experience and so on. So you are proactively as a as a leader or a future leader starting to manage your, your career pathway. And again, it's, it's just removing that idea of it has to be vertical. Um, and I think the other key area actually is, is, is ensuring that, you know, that the skill sets that we've talked about, they are consciously front of your mind, you know, that need for versatility and adaptability, the need to be able to influence, um, in a very different world. Um, it isn't any more a kind of town hall scenario where you are up there with a microphone and all your employees are in front of you. It's digital, it is remote, it is global. So the ability to be able to influence without being in a boardroom with, you know, peers next to you is, is, is really important. And again, it's about having this front of mind, I would say, um, because it's not something easy you can change overnight, but uh, if you're not careful, uh, you look over your shoulder and 10 years have gone by and you suddenly think, oh, I've been doing the same thing with the same style all that time. So it, it, it's consciously making an effort to, to, to think about that adaptability.
some great advice there. And I, I remember not that long ago where even um, having a town hall uh, approach, a, a meeting would mean that you were like a best company to work for because Absolutely. so many people weren't even communicating at all. <laughs> so Absolutely. it's like a big jump on from there. Um, so so that, that's great. We've, we've covered a lot here. And I think a, a key message here is, is obviously we personally, um, as leaders, need to, you know, to be cognizant of this and actually do something about it. But also that from an organizational um, point of view, when it comes to, to changing how you look at that succession planning, when it kept changing how you look at talent, um, it, it's, not, it's not a nice to have. It's absolutely now a must it's have. Absolutely vital. And I would say, just to wrap it up, it is absolutely the role of, of, of HR and the CEO to drive that change forward because it's a different way of thinking right through the organization. Um, and yeah, HR has a really vital role to play in that for sure. Well, thank you so much uh, for your for your time today, Rachel. That was uh, really interesting and uh, it, it, difficult times ahead, but um, you know, important that we we continue to focus on um, on the strategy and on the longer term view as well as the yeah, short term. Some great advice there. So, uh, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.